you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We are walking through the book of Romans, verse by verse. And uh, Romans 6, we're going to finish up this chapter. Today I'd like to talk to you about free from sin. And I don't know about you, but when I think of those three words, that excites me. Okay, and I want to tell you right off the bat, you don't have to sin. If you are born again, you don't have to sin. I'm not saying you won't sin. We all sin. But we don't have to sin because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. If you have a bulletin and want to follow the outline, it's real simple. Number one, the answer. The answer, all right? There will be a question, and we will give you the answer. Number two, the argument. There's always going to be arguments. If you've got two people in a room together, sometime there's an argument. Number three, the absolute. Absolute means this will happen. You can take it to the bank. And folks, if the Word of God says it, then it is so. doesn't matter what man's opinion is. doesn't matter what my opinion is. We walk down through the Bible verse by verse. We interpret it through the Holy Spirit. And uh, the answer, the argument, and the absolute is what we are speaking about today. You know, sin is the most powerful, devastating, destructive decision known to mankind. You think of the world, folks. There is sin all throughout the world. Sin is rebellion against God's nature and His holy word. Sin is incurable by man's own efforts. Although sin promises satisfaction, it only brings misery, frustration, and hopelessness to our lives. The worst part about dying in your sin and rejecting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is that you will spend all of eternity in hell according to the Bible. And that is the bad news. That is the truth of God's Word. The good news is that God sent His only begotten Son to save you from your sins. You do not have to die in your sins because Jesus died on the cross for you and paid the penalty of your sins. Our text today shares the facts, shares that facts with us that we do not have to sin or be slaves to sin. We have freedom in Jesus Christ and can overcome any sin that te Satan tempts us with. I don't know about you, but I say hallelujah when we can overcome any sin in life. What a Savior. Let's look at Romans 6, verse uh, 15. Well, go back to 14 real quick. I just want to read that verse. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And again, we know uh, Paul says this many times in Romans about law versus grace. Now look at verse 15. What then? Okay, there's the question. All right, because of what he has said in the first part, and, and you will see that the question is the same thing he asked in uh, chapter 6, verse 1. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And then the answer is certainly not. And you have to understand it's it's, you know, the law was uh, given for a purpose. The law lets us know when we sin, but the law cannot save you. You can't clean up enough. You can't be right enough uh, with God. You can't do enough good things. You can't go to church enough for salvation. Folks, we are saved by grace in, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is God's grace that saves us. And what he's saying here, and the objection from the Jewish leaders was, well, if grace covers our sin, then we just can sin even more because we live under God's grace. And that's not what Paul is saying. That is not his point even close. That's why he uses the word certainly not, because of sin. Because we are all sinners, we are under grace, but it doesn't give us a license to sin. It's like somebody saying, I know this is wrong, but <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. Well, folks, think about that. 
Think about your thinking there. When Christ comes into my life, He changes my life. He changes my thought patterns. He changes my heart. He changes the, my outlook in the way I see things. And as a Christian, listen to me, every time I sin and you sin, the Holy Spirit says, you did wrong. You broke one of God's laws. And that's when we need to repent of our sins. We need to tell God we are sorry and ask for forgiveness of our sins. And it puts, back, puts us back in a right relationship with Him. So it, it, it is certainly not means it is never okay to sin. And listen to this. The purpose of grace is to free us from sin. Not let us sin even more. Not let us take sin lightly or, or not, not, you know, not just living our own life. Folks, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense is how you were saved. And when we're talking about, you're going to see the word freedom here several times in this text. And the very thing that people think I'm free is really what captures them. Folks, sin captures people. And somebody that don't know Christ, they cannot help but sin. We should not be surprised by what people do without Jesus Christ. They have been cap captured by sin. The best example I can see in the Word of God is the prodigal son. Look at Luke chapter 15. Go with me to Luke 15. You know the story. Uh, a certain man had two sons. One of the younger sons said, hey, dad, I'm tired of your rules. I want to be free. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking of the 60s children and the 70s child. Okay, I'm going to go find myself. You know what I found out about finding myself? If I ever find myself, I don't like what I find. Okay, I'm a sinner no matter where I am. Okay, but he thought, I'm tired of dad's rules. I want freedom. Give me the money you owe me. And by the way, that happens at death. He did not, that father did not have to give him that money. But he did. And he did it because he loved him. Now, now hang on to that, okay? What does he do? He goes to a far country. Long as he had money, long as he is paying for everybody's drinks and having a party and living it up, man, everybody liked him. But you know what happened? He ran out of money. And when you run out of money, folks, your, fr your friend pool dwindles. He found himself so hungry and broke, he was in a pigsty. He was feeding pigs. He was so down that he looked at the food there and said, I wonder how long this has been here. Folks, you're low, low, low if you're going to eat pig slop. Okay? And God allowed him to get into that situation. He came to himself. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? What is he thinking about? He's thinking about his dad. He's thinking about a hot meal. He's thinking about a warm bed. He's thinking about a, a roof over his head. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He realized he didn't have it that bad at home. He didn't even ask to be restored and be his son. He said, just let me work for you, which is what he should have been doing in the first place. And look at, and, and folks, we know what the father did. The father every day looked out and was just hoping his son would come home. And the Bible says he looked out on his porch one, one morning, and he saw in a distance there, and he saw the way that son was walking, and he thought to himself, that's my son. What did he say? Well, I can't wait till he gets here on the porch. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I'm going to reread the rules to him, and I'm going to tell him, you hurt me, and, and you are punished. You are going to come back. Did he say anything like that? No, the Bible said the father ran to him ran to him. Think, folks, that is a picture of salvation, of God forgiving us of our sins 
and the mess we have made in our lives. He killed the fatted calves. He had a party, and guess what? The older brother got upset. The older brother had an attitude, and that's for another time and another place. Go down to verse, or, uh, yeah, verse 31 with me. Look at verse 31. The Bible says, And he said to him, This is his elder son, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. Folks, that's a perfect picture of grace. That is a perfect picture of God's grace. This father forgave his son with no strings attached. And that is what it means, folks. That is what salvation is. In finding his so-called freedom, he was captured by sin till he couldn't. And folks, I am telling you, some folks have to hit rock bottom before they realize where they are spiritually. And in Galatians, go with me to Galatians chapter 4. Paul is also saying, talking about uh, sonship. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from the slave, though he is master of all. And it's saying the, the very same thing. Okay, when we have children, we do everything for them, okay? They are under our rules. We take care of them. We don't want any harm to come to them. Uh, again, they, they have no rights as an adult, whether it's a slave or a child, but is under guardians and stewardship into the appointed time of the father until they grow old enough to the age of accountability, until they grow old enough to know what they are doing is wrong if they are sinning. Verse 3, even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Folks, I'm telling you, this world is bombarding our children. They are telling them right is wrong and wrong is right. And we as parents and grandparents, we have to guide our children. We have to pray for our children. We have to uh, discipline our children. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And folks, again, the law was given so that we would know that we were sinners, that we would know when we sin. And Jesus Christ came, and He took the place of the law. Yes, we need to read the Old Testament. Yes, we need to obey the Ten Commandments. But salvation can only be found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 6, And because you are sons... God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Folks, when you truly get saved, He places the Holy Spirit into your life, and you surrender your will, everything that you are to Him, and He is your heavenly Father. And therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. See, we were slaves to sin, before we found Christ. But God, through Jesus Christ, has made us sons. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. What does an heir mean? It means everything that Jesus has, we have at our disposal also. Think about Jesus. Lived 33 years and never sinned. Now folks, I'm telling you, I, I, I mean, you have to believe that. You have to believe that. That is part of our doctrine. He was the perfect Lamb of God. So we have the Holy Spirit with us. We have Jesus' example in us and that we can see, and we have the God the Father looking over us. What else do we need to not sin, folks? It is an obedient spirit. It is an obedient spirit. So the answer is, when it comes to grace, is it the law or grace? Folks, I'm telling you, it is grace. 
It is God's grace that saves us. The second thing is the argument. Now again, folks, some people argue just to be arguing, okay? But we're talking about the Word of God here. You don't argue with the Word of God. You accept the Word of God by faith. Look at verse 16. Do you not know to to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, that you are one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? He gets right into the meat of the conversation in this last part here. He's saying everyone obeys someone. Everyone obeys someone. Everyone serves someone. And as people, we have a choice, okay? Are we going to obey God? Are we going to obey ourselves or sin? And that's what he is saying here. Matter of fact, three times he talks about death. The word death is in these scriptures that we are seeing, and we'll talk about that at the end. Verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered. What is he saying? Thank be to God. God, thank you for saving me. God, thank you for saving me from my sin. Thank you that I don't have to sin. He is telling us that. And folks, you, you, you have just two choices, to obey God or to not obey God. When you obey God, I am telling you, you've made it a right choice and a good choice. But when you obey yourself, when you live for yourself, folks, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. Matter of fact, Matthew 6. Look at Matthew 6. Just one verse. One verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Okay? All right, when there was a slave, and and again, folks, we're talking about the Roman days. I know it's a negative connotation, but that's the way it was back then. And slaves were totally under the authority of their masters in biblical times. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot If you mark in your Bible, underline or circle, you cannot serve God and mammon. And you can plug a lot of things in there, but it basically means God or man. Man rules. Okay? You can't serve them both. You have to make a choice. And as Christians, when you ask Christ to come into your life, you made that choice. Joshua 24, 15 says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But it doesn't mean when you get saved, you don't sin anymore. It doesn't mean that you won't be tempted anymore. It simply means that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you telling you first not to do it. And the second thing is telling you, you know, that it, this is not good. This is not good what you're doing. You can obey God, and you can obey His Word. And folks, it's more than just saying no to temptation. You have to replace that sin with something spiritual, something that will make you forget that temptation that is in your life. And he says, I thank God that you were, uh, were, though you were slaves to sin, you obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine which you were delivered. Folks, we have the Word of God. The Word of God. That's why every growing Christian needs to spend time in the Word of God. Psalms chapter 1, it says, In the law I meditate day and night. Folks, you need to start your day with reading the Bible. You need to end your day with reading the Bible. And you need to pray to God in between. Why? Because of our flesh. Because of our flesh. Look at verse 18. And having been set free from sin, you become slaves to righteousness. So what do we do? We obey God. We look for the righteousness simply is doing the right thing every time. Righteousness, obeying God, 
listening to his word, obeying his word, doing the right thing. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. You know what you battle? Folks, we battle this every day, our flesh. What is our flesh? And again, it is flesh and blood. Do you know the biggest problem in your life? It's when you look in that mirror. I am, folks, nobody makes me sin. Nobody holds me down and makes me sin. I am the problem. And if we live in the flesh, I'm telling you, we cannot please God. It says that even earlier in Romans chapter 6. So our weakness is our flesh. Look at Mark chapter 14. Look at this. And you have to understand what's going on here. Jesus was about to die, okay? And Jesus needed his big three, Peter, James, and John, to stay awake and to pray for him. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus told them, I'm going to go and I'm going to pray. You stay here and you pray for me. Look at verse 37. Then he came and found them sleeping. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's okay to, to, pray your, um, yeah, to pray yourself to sleep. I do that sometimes in the middle of the night. I'll wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I'll be wide awake. And do you know what? If I will just start praying, and I don't know anybody that goes to this church, you don't have an excuse. If you look at our prayer list, you would spend the next hour and a half praying if you've seen our prayer list. I don't understand. Somebody says, I don't know what to pray about. Folks, pray for the salvation. There's so many things that we can pray for. But what were they doing? They were sleeping. And, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? <laughs> That's funny to me. That's funny. He, he saw him sleeping. Could you not watch for one hour? Listen to this. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. When you are tempted, start praying is what Jesus says. Why? Because you cannot think two thoughts at the same time. If that temptation comes into your life and you are tempted to do something wrong, the Holy Spirit says, oh, you're messing up here. You're messing up here right then. Don't say I need to go get my Bible. Don't say I'll talk about it later. Don't say I'm going to overcome this on my own. He says right then you start praying. Look at this, lest you enter into temptation. And here's the key. The Spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is is weak. I'm telling you, I'll give you a perfect example. When I'm on a diet, I'm just telling you, the smell of cinnamon rolls drives me crazy. Crazy. And if I, for some crazy reason, and, and I do, I, I, I go get donuts for my grandkids on Fridays, and those cinnamon rolls are just telling me, come by me, come eat... They're about that big. You know what my flesh wants? Not one. Not two. Three cinnamon rolls. So what I have to do, and folks, I am telling you, I, there is a battle when I walk into any donut shop. There's a battle. I love my grandkids, and I love Kylie. When she walks in on Wednesdays and Fridays, she asks, Papa, you buy me donuts? I'm buying donuts, all right? But you know what my flesh is? One won't hurt you. I'm just giving you a prime example. And you're right, one won't hurt me, but it sure won't help my diabetes, okay? And I have this battle going on. And folks, that is the way it is with sin. He tempts you. He don't hit you in your weakest points all the time. He also hits you in your strongest points, and he keeps changing things up. And I'm telling you, that's what Jesus is saying. Your spirit, I want to do right. I want to do the right thing. But man, my flesh is weak. Think of Peter. Man, I'll die for you, man. Jesus, I'll die for you. Yet somebody called his hand around a fire. And the Bible says he cursed and said, I don't know. I don't know the man. Folks, our flesh is strong and we have to get control of our flesh. We have to say no to temptation and no to what we want and realize let's do what 
God wants. Galatians 2.20, you just sang that. You just sang it. It is so true. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Okay? What does it mean? I died to self. When I invited Jesus Christ into my life, folks, I am telling you, 22 years old, for 22 years, I did what I wanted to do. The prodigal son is a picture of my life. I walked away from church for two solid years when I was 19 and 20 years old because I thought that was the way to find my freedom. But I realized in my own life, you know, I was the problem. I could not, oh, I tried to overcome temptation. I tried to say no to sin, but I couldn't do it until I truly got saved. Until Jesus Christ came into my life and changed my heart and changed my life. And I said, now I'm dead to sin. I'm dead. It is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, you still have to live in the flesh. Temptation is still out there, but you have God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit on your side I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Folks, I'm telling you, when it comes to my family, when it comes to my children, when it comes to my grandchildren, I have no, and my wife, I have no problem dying for them. I will protect them, and I will protect them even if it takes my life. And folks, Jesus Christ died for you. And we simply have to die to ourselves. See, the biggest three problems we have is sin, self, and stuff. Those are the three things that we battle all the time. We battle sin, we battle self, and we battle materialistic things. And to walk with Christ, to be free from sin, to be able to say no to temptation, we have to crucify the flesh. And that's what he's saying. Look at verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for it is right for for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. What does he mean, set aside the grace? Folks, I can't just say, hey, God's going to forgive me of that. You are being a disgrace to grace. You are taking advantage of grace. And a true Christian doesn't want to do it. It doesn't mean we won't sin. But we know when we sin, we know when we're wrong, we know when the Holy Spirit tells us, you need to repent of that. You need to change. You need to go back and apologize. You need to say, hey, I'm sorry. And folks, that's what he is saying in Romans. He's saying we can be free from the flesh if we will obey the Spirit of God. Now look what it says in the rest of this part. For just as you presented your members back in Romans as slave of uncleanliness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. See, verse 18 says, having been set free from sin. Folks, I'm telling you, we make the Christian life harder than it really is. We do. Why? Because we've been set free from sin. So the question is already answered. If, if it's to sin or not to sin, what do you do? You don't sin. You don't sin. Matter of fact, you can ask yourself, and I know it's just, it's, it's almost childlike. What would Jesus do? Did he ever sin? No, he set a perfect example. He has a perfect record. 33 years of not sinning. I'm thinking he knows what he's doing. So we follow Jesus Christ. We follow the Holy Spirit. And that's what he is saying. You have to say no to your flesh and present your members as slaves to Jesus Christ. Folks, the argument, and really there is not an argument. If you want to quit sinning, you have to die to self. You have to die to flesh. You have to obey the Spirit of God. The third thing and last I want to share with you. Not only the, the the question was answered, the argument. Folks, spiritually, we are slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. That's what he's saying. 
in the third thing. And here's the absolute part, part of that in verse 20. For when you were slaves to sin, notice the tense there. I am not a slave to sin anymore. And it's not just positive thinking. It's believing. It is growing. It is reading the Word of God. It's coming to church. It is praying. It is witnessing to others. The closer you get to Christ, the further you get away from sin. That's the bottom line, folks. You get as close to Christ as you can, and it becomes easier. But I'm telling you, Satan will go away for a season, but I'm telling you, he'll come back. He will come back. And, and somebody asked me, well, when am I going to quit being tempted? When you take your last breath. As long as you're alive, you have this battle going on inside of you. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed of? You know what Satan loves to do? He wants us to dwell on our past. Dwell on our past. He loves to bring up things. And folks, I'm telling you, when you get saved, the Bible says your sins are erased as far as the east is from the west. And when it comes to judgment, you will not, you will only be judged from the point you got saved. Okay, your sin was judged at the cross. But I'm telling you, your sin nowadays, it, it'll be your works that will be judged. Your works. And Satan just wants to keep you beat down. Satan wants to tell you, uh, you're sorry, you're no good. All right, you did this and you did that. And I can tell you how we react sometimes. Have you ever done this? You did something wrong and God convicted you and you asked for forgiveness of it. And then about an hour later, you ask for forgiveness again. And then at night before you get to bed, you ask for forgiveness again. And you know what God said? I forgave you the first time. Folks, if you truly repent, if you truly ask for forgiveness, God forgives us. It is Satan that brings up that stuff. It is Satan. Now look at verse 22. Oh, the rest, 21. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. There's that word again, is death. Now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. What do we have to do, folks? We have to put the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, just real quickly. Galatians 5. Look what they are. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that you need to pray for. These are the things that you need to ask. All right? There's bad fruit, and there's good fruit, folks. Bad fruit is sin. Good fruit are the fruits of the Spirit. You need to grow. You just say, I can't have all those things. I can't be all those things. But folks, we should strive for the fruits of the Spirit. In the last part, look at verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Three times he says the wages of sin is death. If you die in your sin, if you don't accept Jesus Christ into your life, folks, I am telling you, it is death. It is a death sentence. And you say, well, Brother Mike, we're all going to die. Yes, you are. Every one of us is going to die, but we don't have to die the second death. Because if we accept Jesus Christ into our lives, I am telling you, we will go and live with Jesus forever and ever and ever. And I don't know anyone I don't anyone, know anyone, and I did have one person in my life told me they wanted to go to hell. And do you know what this young person said? And do you know the reasoning behind it? Because all my friends will be there. I, I, I just almost didn't know how to react to that, to that response. But he obviously doesn't think hell 
is real. Folks, that's what he is talking about. He's saying if you die in your sin, if you don't accept Jesus Christ into your life, if you don't ask for forgiveness of your sin, you have nothing to look forward to. It is death. Matter of fact, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, let me end with this. Revelation 20, this is the end times. This is the great white throne judgment. There's two types of judgment. The great white throne will be for the lost, and the bema seat is for the saved. That's where your works will be judged. But for the lost, look at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before God. The Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. God will judge everyone. And the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. We're talking about hell there, okay? And they were judged, each one according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Folks, that is the truth of the gospel. Hell is real. It's a real place. It's not an imaginary place. But folks, you know what the gospel literally means? It means good news. I've got good news for you today. That if you will admit that you're a sinner, if you will repent of your sin, if you will tell God, I'm sorry, if you will invite Jesus to come into your life, if you will come under His authority, if you will be His servant, His servant, I've got news for you. You can be saved today. Folks, Steve said it earlier, and I'll say it again. The greatest day of my life was the day I invited Jesus Christ into my life. It is the greatest day. And my prayer as we close here, if there's one person that doesn't know Christ, that today would be their day of salvation. And to the Christian, listen to me, Christian, you don't have to sin. You don't have to. You have a choice. We all have choices. Choose not to sin. Father, thank You for the day. God, I thank You for the book of Romans. Lord, the book of Romans is the gospel. God, I thank You for uh, just the Apostle Paul. Man, three times he talked about death there. We're all going to die. And God, I pray that You would just speak to us. I just pray that the Holy Spirit And God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you, they would just come. Man, we can help them. We can pray with them. We can show them Scripture. So God, we pray that you would just do a work in and amongst us. And God, I pray for the Christian that's just defeated today. God, Satan, just beat them down and beat them down and beat them down. And God, I pray, Lord, that they would realize that they don't have to sin. The greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That they realize the, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God, I pray they could come out from under that guilt. But God, first they have to repent. First they have to cry out to you. Oh yeah, they're saved. They're going to heaven. But they just haven't been living for you. So God, would you do a work among us? If somebody here that needs to follow the Lord in baptism... Or Lord, somebody that wants to join, I pray that your spirit would talk to them and speak to them. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?